Hello and welcome to the latest in the Mackerel Solicitors webinars. I am Alison Green, a partner and head of the family and relationship team here. Today we will be discussing the unmarried family and issues on breakdown. Next slide please. I am joined today by Manisha Hurchin and Jim Richards from my team. We are we're also pleased to be joined once again by Barrister Maria Scotland of Five St Andrews Hill Chambers. Maria is a specialist in family law matters and has day-to-day -day experience in court dealing with the issues we are going to talk about today. At the end of this webinar there will be a question and answer session so please do send in your questions using the chat box and we will endeavour to deal with those at the end. Next slide please. When a family breaks down, there are a number of matters which parties will have to consider, which we will be discussing today. When parties are unmarried, there is no specific legislation which is applicable, as there is for married parties, and therefore a number of pieces of disparate legislation have to be considered. In this webinar, we will be looking at the most common issue that arises, which is the division of the former family home. The law is complex in this area and we will endeavour to simplify it for you. We will also be looking at parenting plans if there are children involved. Parents are best advised to reach an agreement on where the children will live and where they will spend their time. We will talk about how parenting plans can help coordinate the lives of the children after a breakup. However, if no such agreement is possible, we will also discuss how you can make an application to the court seeking a child arrangements order regulating the care of your children. Finally, we will cover child maintenance. We will explain what this is, who should pay and how much they should pay. My colleague Jim is now going to talk to us about the division of the family home. Jim. Good morning. Um... Thank you. The slides just arrived. <laughs> so um, owning a property together, well, um, it's fairly common practice these days. Um, unfortunately, one of the problems we face in this area is, as Alison's highlighted, there is no uh, family-based or uh, legislation which comprehensively deals with this area in a way which is realistic. Instead, we have a piece of legislation which is principally di designed to deal with um, property law um, and trust law and doesn't fit easily with the um, rationale that often occurs between family members, married or unmarried. But the one thing I want to really emphasize from the start is that there is no concept in this area of the common law husband or wife. That is simply something which exists elsewhere in people's minds, but it certainly doesn't have any um, relevance or meaning in this context. So what we have to default to essentially is property law and trust law, and that is very complicated. So, can I have the next slide, please? Now, uh, essentially, there are two areas here which could uh, lead to a court application. Um, we have one situation where po possibly the house is jointly owned. Uh, we have other situations where the house is owned in one person's name only. Uh, the first situation is quite straightforward in as much as the law tends to follow the paperwork. So the paperwork at the land registry, any other documentation which the parties prepared when they were purchasing the property, that will essentially be definitive. Now, if you're in a situation where you own a property jointly with your former partner and the relationship has ended, you can make a claim or an application to the court to determine the matter. So for example, if the other person refuses to cooperate in a sale or they refuse to move out, then there's an application which can be made under trust of land leg legislation. And that will result in an order being made by the court, which essentially reflects the jointly owned status, assuming that neither one of you is saying that the shares ought to be um, other than the way it's set out at the land registry. Now, the second category of case is more complicated. That involves either one person saying that in a jointly owned situation, the circumstances have changed since the point of purchase. It could be that the issue isn't dealt with as soon as the uh, relationship ends and that one party continues to live in the property. They may develop the property, they may pay the mortgage. Uh, and as a result of that, they may then say that they're entitled to something more than the 50%. 
There's another category again, which is even more complicated, and that involves a case where the property is in one person's name, but the uh, other person says as a result of the agreement, the contributions, the joint intention throughout the relationship that they're entitled to something which isn't actually reflected on the land registry documentation. And so the Trust of Land Act legislation is a mechanism by which that agreement, the, uh, the joint intention and the contributions can be resolved. So that can result in what's called a declaration as to the beneficial interest, uh, which isn't necessarily or won't in fact be registered on the land registry documentation. But what I really want to get over to everyone is that this is evidence-based. And one of the difficulties here is that we're dealing with domestic relationships, relationships which are founded initially on emotion. So when the sun is shining, everyone uh, thinks that it's all gonna be uh, peachy in time, that no one would ever um, do the wrong thing. Uh, and so documentation isn't uh, kept. There aren't uh, records of what you agreed. It's all what you say and what the other person says. And one of the real problems any lawyer will encounter in this area is obtaining the evidence which supports what you say happened at the time the property was bought or there or afterwards and which gives rise to your interest in the property and it really is evidence-based rather than uh, just information or facts in the in the general sense uh, and that that's the the complexity in this area of law can i have the next slide so what happens the general principles are as i've explained that the property essentially uh follows the law so a jointly owned property will um, be jointly uh, disposed of and each will be entitled to an equal share unless there's some evidence to the contrary if a property is in one person's name they may wish to retain it um, or they may, may wish to sell the property and they're entitled at the start to um, to take the whole of the sale proceeds. If there's a dispute between the parties, then that's the, uh, the area on which the, the courts will um, deal with the application in the way I've described. And it involves a protracted process in the county court or in the chancery division of the high court to uh, furnish evidence and follow the, the various civil procedures which exist to, to deal with this. It can be very long, very expensive and very stressful. But the starting point, as we've said, is that the documentation trumps everything. And so it's absolutely vital if you are in a relationship uh, or thinking of starting a relationship and buying a property that you reflect on the situation which could happen if things go wrong. So be aware of the, uh, the fact that documentation will be relevant and consider even at the start of a relationship um, consulting a lawyer. But the real issue here is that if you're not sure, if you're uncertain about the um, nature of your interest or what the other person is trying to do, then before agreeing to anything in terms of um, a sale or moving out, take legal advice because we're able to take information from you and advise you about the merits and the value and whether or not it's worthwhile pursuing any of these claims. But again, I have to emphasize that what this boils down to is evidence and the extent to which you can illustrate what you're saying um, with um, documentation and otherwise. So, now the next slide. Order for sale and the division of the sale proceeds. Well, um, an order for sale, there's a, there's a clue in the title there. Um, this is a court order which uh, is made by a judge at the end of um, one of these cases under the Trust of Land Act legislation and essentially provides that the property is sold. Now, what's significant about any court order is that it's enforceable, which means that if someone doesn't comply with the timetable and the detail of the order, um, you can do something about it. So ultimately, you can ask a judge to sign paperwork which transfers the property uh, and other things which enable the sale to progress, notwithstanding that one person may be um, avoiding uh, doing that. And so even when one party wants to make things difficult, uh, the order for sale is something which can um, resolve that. 
In terms of the division of the sale proceeds, again, the outcome of a Trust of Land Act case will be the definition of what the interests in a particular property are, the extent of the beneficial interest. And the uh, court will then reflect that in an order. And on sale, that's what each of you will receive. So very narrow um, uh, orders uh, for sale or to declare what your interest is, very much different from the approach which is taken, for example, in a divorce case, where there is more of an overview in terms of the, um, the marriage and, and it's focusing on things like needs or sharing or fairness. It's a very different approach in Trust of Land Act cases. And that can give rise to a number of problems and a number of circumstances, which on the face of it can appear profoundly unfair. So one of the ways to mitigate that is to take legal advice um, before, during, and perhaps after the relationship comes to an end. That's the best way to ensure that your um, sense of what should happen actually does take place in practice. So I think that's me. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> um, Maria, can you talk to us about some of the cases that you have worked on to give everyone an idea about how the courts tend to determine property ownership and the division of the sale proceeds? Yes, certainly. Um, I'd like to share the details of, um, make sure I'm unmuted. Uh, yes, I'd like to share the details of a couple of cases which I've been instructed in recently to give you an idea about how the courts, that is the Chancery Division judges, determine these cases and the issues that can arise, which Jim's already alluded to. Um, it was pretty hard to decide which cases to share with you because um, I've done so many over the last 25 years, but I've identified two uh, where, which I think was simplest. Um, case study one, my client had purchased a property in Lambeth with her former partner and the father of their two sons in about 1999 for £88,000. They, at the time that they purchased their property, they had no children, they were um, a cohabiting couple, but they'd in, they bought their home intending it to be a family home they then went on to have two children but they never got married um, their sons were born in 2000 and 2001 now the reason i share that with you and what's important about that is that uh, this is a recent case and of course in their, with their children being born in 2000 and 2001 both their children were adults at the time or nigh on being adults at the time that this case came to court and that was relevant because my client that was then deprived of any opportunity of making a claim for the benefit of the children under Schedule 1. And this was a straightforward argument about property rights between an unmarried, um, previously cohabiting couple. My client and her former boyfriend, um, as I said, never married, um, and they separated some time ago, which is what was key about this case. They separated seven years ago in 2013, at the time when the children were both at secondary school, my client had remained in the family home and her former partner had moved out. He moved on, literally. He had a new girlfriend and he moved into his new girlfriend's house. My client was left in the home in a firm belief that her former partner had given her property, that it was hers, that he'd moved on and that um, she could keep the house. Now, this is relevant and, um, because what then happened is that she then paid the mortgage and she renovated the property. Her mother passed away very sadly and she inherited some uh, monies and she updated the property, put in a bathroom, new windows, etc. Um, at the time she came to see me, what was relevant about this property had been purchased by them jointly and it had been registered on the face of the land registry in their joint names. There was no declaration of trust setting out that the time they purchased it, it was owned in unequal shares. My client had taken no steps to deal with the property in any way in 2013 when they separated. And so at the time that she came to see me, her, she'd received solicitors uh, correspondence from her former partner through solicitors uh, seeking an order for sale of the property in an equal share. And, and she was blindsided by this. Uh, and, uh, and I had to tell her that the property is registered in joint names, there's no declaration of trust, you've taken no steps thereafter. On the face of it, the court going to deal with this as a property that's owned uh, um, jointly back when you bought it and jointly now. 
Um, this case um, took 18 months to travel through the court to a final hearing. It was hard fought. My client felt um, that she was justified in seeking 100% of the property. She said that her former partner had promised this to her, but that we had no evidence. Ultimately, a judge ordered that property should be sold, should be sold on a joint conduct basis um, by reason that both children had left their schools. Um, but the proceeds of short sale should be divided unequally in shares to compensate my client for the work that she carried out to the property after 2013. So the court felt that it was owned jointly, but there was a, uh, their intentions had changed post-2013 uh, and thereafter there'd been a departure from ownership, but only to the extent to cover the cost of the renovation works, which was around about 45-55% ownership in my client's favour. At the time the party sold this property, it was worth 580,000. So considerably expensive um, uh, and, and clearly my client should have seen solicitors either at the date they bought it or at least in 2013. My second case study, um, similar situation in that uh, my client, again the former girlfriend in a relationship, had bought a family home together with her former boyfriend in about 2000. Um, these were both professional people who had entered a relationship, one of um, where they were um, mutually um, committed to each other, but they didn't take the step of marrying. Um, they did go on to have a child together. They had a daughter who was 15 at the time that my client came to see me. So that was the former girlfriend. This was a relationship which endured until 2016 for 17 years. Um, and my client came to see me in 2017, 2018, um, when her former bo boyfriend had moved out and he then went to see solicitors and sought an order for sale of the property. Now the details of this case were that these were both professional people who had a lot of money and a good high income. They had come to this relationship with a house each and they both uh, sold their properties in around about 2000, bought this large family home together jointly for 700,000. My client's contribution to the purchase of that property was not nearly double that of her former partner, uh, 182,000 to his 100,000. And the balance was uh, raised on a joint mortgage. Despite their unequal contributions towards the property, they purchased this in their joint names and registered it in their joint names. And they did not enter into any deed of trust or anything which set out that they would own it on unequal shares. The simple reason is, and Jim's already alluded to this, uh, at the time that they um, had got together, it was all blue skies. And my client had never for one moment contemplated a circumstance down the line whereby her former partner would uh, seek to say that she was not entitled to a share of the property in uh, which correlated with the her contributions. Um, so um, this is the case where her former partner moved out. He sought an order for the uh, sale of the property and, and, and an equal share. My client wanted a deferred sale until their daughter, who was, as I said, 15, had completed her education and she wanted unequal share. She wanted 65 to 70% of the proceeds of sale of the property. This again, sadly, was a case where there was no evidence, written or otherwise, which would um, persuade a judge in the county court that their intention at the time they purchased it and they registered the property jointly was to own it in unequal shares. This was a case which went to final hearing. It was heard by a judge in the central London County Court who ordered this property be sold and the proceeds divided equally much to the unhappiness of my client, but there we are. Um, but he delayed completion of sale until summer 2018 to allow the party's daughter to complete her GCSEs. And that was done by reason that my client had made an application under the Schedule 1 of the Children Act. The value of the house on the date of sale was 2.7 million. So had it been owned in unequal shares, clearly there was uh, considerable equity in that property. Both cases, both ladies were utterly distraught. Uh, both believed that they were entitled to either 100% of the proceeds of the property, uh, outright ownership, or greater than 50%. Both believed they were entitled to uh, this as mothers, and what they believed was common law wife, which, as Jim told you, there's no such concept 
and both were utterly upset with the state of the law, which they were ignorant of until it was too late. And so the key take home here is vital to seek legal advice and assistance, either when purchasing a property or when your relationship breaks up. Um, and certainly the date you separate, um, the consequences of not doing so can be costly both emotionally and certainly financially. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Um, can I have the next slide, please? We're now going to move on to parenting plans and how parents can reach an agreement about where a child will live and or spend time. When the family breaks down and there are children, parents are best advised to reach an agreement on where the children will live and what time each child will spend with each parent. Parents can decide whether the children will live with one parent and spend time with the other, or for example, share their time between the separated parents' homes. Older children are often able to make decisions for themselves and frequently do. They can go between the homes if that's feasible. And once parents live apart, older children tend to do what they want to do and what makes them happy, even if their parents have agreed something different. Quite often we call that voting with their feet. Younger children and babies obviously need parents to make arrangements in their best interests. If parents are not able to reach an agreement on their own, then assistance can be obtained from a mediator or else from a solicitor. As we've said before, mediators are independent third parties whose role is to facilitate negotiation between parents with the aim of assisting them reaching an agreement. This may not be appropriate if the dynamic between the parent is such that one parent is domineering or abusive or refuses to agree and listen. And in those circumstances, that's often where solicitors get involved and can help. We can always help you negotiate arrangements for your children, always bearing in mind what is in their best interests. The best advice is that any arrangement that you enter into with the assistance of a mediator or indeed a solicitor is put into a written parenting plan to provide you and your child with stability and peace of mind. And we can help with the drafting of those plans. Maria is now going to talk to us about applications to the court for child arrangement orders, where it's not possible to reach a parenting plan. Maria. Thank you. Um, if you're not able to reach a parenting plan between yourself and your, uh, the other parent of your children, whether on your own or using a mediator, which has been alluded to by um, Alison, then the next step could be to make an application to the family court seeking a court order regulating the arrangements for the children. That is where they live and then what time they spend between um, the, the house in which they live and the other separated parent or else they share their home between two homes and the time that they spend in each, both during the school term time and school holidays. Um, and the application is made on what's called a form C100 it's uh, made online um, in the, to the family court. And it costs £215, although that uh, cost can be waived or uh, reduced uh, in certain circumstances, such as you're on benefits. Um, the family court is currently operating remotely during the pandemic, that is by telephone or video. So the court is not only accepting applications at the moment, but also listing those applications yeah. for hearing. Once an application is made online to the family court, the court will then list that application for a court hearing called a directions hearing with both parents to attend currently attending remotely by video telephone. Um, prior to the date of that hearing, which will usually be about six weeks to eight weeks after the date that it's, the application is made to the family court, prior to that hearing, the court will ask a service called CAFCAS, who represent children in court. CAFCAS stands for Children and Family Court Advisory and Support Service to carry out some checks for them. These are safeguarding checks that are required by CAFCAS uh, of the court to be carried out. CAFCAS check um, with the police and the local authority to find out whether there are any known safety or welfare risks to the child or the children, the subject of the application. The next thing that CAFCAS do is that they interview each parent. And this is, and certainly at the moment, the, the interviews are being conducted by telephone. Um, CAFCAS will 
um, contact each parent that um, both parents are um, details are provided on the application so they will lift those details from the application contact each parent to uh, introduce themselves and then also to um, provide them with a telephone interview um, date and time when they will be called. Kafkas will then speak to each parent to find out whether or not they feel that there are any safeguarding issues or, or welfare issues in the case. And then before the first hearing, Kafkas will provide the court with a short report on the outcomes of the safeguarding checks that they've carried out with police and local authority and the outcomes of their telephone interviews with each parent. This is called a safeguarding letter. Uh, and both parents will be provided with a copy by email prior to the hearing. Then there follows the first court hearing. At this hearing, the judge or the may lay magistrates, if it's before magistrates, will try and work out firstly what the parents do agree on in the application. So if they agree where the child lives, and maybe the issue is what time they spend with the other parent, or wh whether they don't have any agreements whatsoever. So they'll, they'll identify what's agreed, what's not agreed, and then thirdly, whether there are any risks to the child. The court will encourage an agreement between um, parents, or, or an agreement that's in the child's best interest. Um, if there are no concerns about child welfare and the court is able to um, enable the parents to reach an agreement, they will uh, translate that into a consent order, um, setting out the uh, child arrangement. If a an agreement cannot be reached between the parents at the first hearing, the judge or magistrate will then timetable the application to um, and then set out what happens next. And if agreement cannot be reached, then the issue about what happens next is one that's considered by the court. They can, the court can either order a further hearing, what's called um, a dispute resolution appointment hearing. This is a sort of uh, mediation type hearing. So that can be listed or else a fact finding hearing. If there are any disputed allegations of risk, then the court consider whether or not it's appropriate to list a separate hearing to determine those facts. So they will decide what's more likely, is the child at risk and is the, are the, these welfare risks um, uh, uh, related to and relevant to the time that the child spends with each parent and where the child should live. So they'll either list it for dispute resolution hearing or fact finding hearing. The alternative is they can list it straight through to a final hearing. So in cases where there are no welfare risks, it's quite clear that it's just a straight dispute between parents with, uh, about what time the child spends with each parent or what arrangements are made for the parent. They'll list it straight through to a final hearing and the judge will decide what happens and make a final order. The other alternative is that the court can ask CAFCAS to do a more detailed piece of work with the family and write a report making, setting out their recommendations um, about what's in the child's best interest. And this is known as Section 7 report. Mm -hmm. So there are matters that court can consider at the first hearing, including making consent order or else timetabling the application. Ultimately, whatever happens in the application, the judge or the magistrates will only make an order that's in the child's best interest. The order which regulates where the child lives and what time it spends between the parents is called a child arrangements order. It lasts until the child is 16 years old, unless the child has special needs. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Um, before we carry on, just a reminder, if you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box um, and then we will endeavour to answer those at the end. Can I have the next slide, please? So CAFCAS, who Maria referred to, have also given parents some guidance in relation to child arrangements during the current pandemic. Children should maintain their usual routine of spending time with each of their parents during the pandemic. If there is a parenting plan or a child arrangements order in place, then this should be complied with unless to do so would put your child or others at risk. This will help your child to feel a sense of consistency as arrangements will continue as normal, whilst also reassuring them that the parent that they do not always live with is safe and healthy. If you're not able to maintain your child's routine due to the illness or self-isolation, or indeed due to the non-availability of those people who ordinarily support your child's contact, 
then do remember to communicate that clearly and honestly with the co-parent. If it is not safe for you to communicate directly, for example, if there's been a history of domestic abuse, then consider using a trusted third party to help you. If any court directed time is missed, think about how you and the co-parent may be able to make up the child's time after the restrictions are limited. Do remember that the time that the child spends with the parents is for their benefit, not for the benefit of the parents. Remember that any rearranged time should also be what is best for the child and it shouldn't be used as a source of tension or conflict between parents. This is especially important at a time when the child is likely to be feeling anxious about the current situation and the effects of the pandemic. We're going to move on now to child maintenance and Manisha is going to help us with that. Thanks Alison. So firstly, for those who maybe are not that familiar with the term, when we use the term child maintenance, we are describing the financial support paid by one person called the paying party to another called the receiving party towards a child's everyday living costs when their parents are separated. So if we break that down a little further, the paying party is the parent who doesn't have main data to care of the child and who therefore is liable in law to pay child maintenance to the other parent. So the receiving party is the parent who does have main day to day care of the child and who receives the benefit of payments of child maintenance from the paying party. Now it might be important for some of you out there to note that it's not just single parents who are entitled to claim child maintenance. So if for example a grandparent is caring for a child instead of one of the child's parents, the grandparent will be entitled to child maintenance too. It's also available to non-family members, so if there's a situation where a guardian is the child's carer, the guardian will also be entitled to child maintenance payments. So generally payments are made for children under the age of 16, but if that child is in full-time education, payments can continue until they are 20 years old. Now, the definition of full-time education for the purposes of child maintenance is not higher than A-level or equivalent. So in Scotland, this would be Scottish hires and advanced hires. Taking a real life example, if a child was 19 years old and still at school, then their parent would be entitled to child maintenance parents. But if that same child were 19 at university, the parent they live with would not be entitled to payments. So in terms of how it all works then, um, parents can make private agreements between themselves for the payments um, of child maintenance. And this is called a family-based arrangement. So as it suggests, the family um, agree everything themselves and there's no need for anyone else or any other company or body to be involved. Next slide, please. Now, if parents can't agree a family-based arrangement, then a government body called the Child Maintenance Service, CMS for short, has jurisdiction to determine the level of child maintenance payments. So the CMS has jurisdiction to assess and then chase payments of child maintenance for the receiving party from the paying party for the benefit of the child in question. So a bit of background history on this service. Um, the government introduced the CMS system of child support in 2012 to take over from its predecessor government department, which was the Child Support Agency, or CSA for short. Now, the new scheme, scheme was introduced with the aim of encouraging parents to come to collaborative family-based arrangements wherever possible. Even though the CMS has been up and running in the UK for about eight years now, um, its powers are still probably not widely understood by most, and so a summary of its role is as follows. So the CMS can locate the paying party um, if the receiving party doesn't know where they live in order to try and sort out child maintenance. The CMS can determine by testing any paternity disputes that might be, you know, in the mix. Um, the CMS can assess the amount to be paid by the paying party. It can arrange for the paying parent to pay child maintenance. It can also pass payments on to the receiving parent if that's the preference. 
It can review payment amount where changes in circumstances are reported. It can review payment amount on an annual basis and it can enforce payments when the paying party defaults. Of note is that the child maintenance arrangements made through the CSA, so the predecessor to the CMS, ended on the 31st of December 2017. So all issues between parties in respect of payments of child maintenance are now dealt with through the CMS. Um, at this point, you might be wondering, well, how much child maintenance do I have to pay or does one have to pay? How does that all come to being? Um, well, this is dependent on the income of the paying party. So maintenance calculations are based on paying parties gross income. Now, when the CMS looks at this, there are different rates depending upon the income. So when it's calculated, expenses such as pension contributions, um, perhaps child maintenance or support being paid for other children are taken into account to obtain the gross income of that paying parent. So when they've broken it down and come to a gross income figure, that is what they use to calculate the payments. Once they have that gross figure, other considerations can also be taken into account. Um, for example, the amount of time that the paying party spends with that child, and that's in terms of overnight stays. So who does the CMS cover then? Well, its jurisdiction is the UK. So in other words, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, but it doesn't include the Channel Islands or the Isle of Man, which might be important to note for some. Now the CMS only has jurisdiction if both parties live in the UK and the income of the paying party is less than the statutory scheme's upper limit and that upper limit is currently £3,000 per week for income tax and national insurance, so gross. If one or more of the parties live abroad, the CMS is unable to give a calculation of the amount of maintenance a non-resident parent should pay, so again something to note. Um, and with most things, there are limited exceptions to that, but that's quite specific. So if it's something that you need some advice or guidance on, please contact us and we'll have a discussion. Another question you might be asking is, well, are the family courts involved in, in child maintenance? Um, generally, no, the family courts aren't because they don't have jurisdiction when the CMS has jurisdiction. Again, as with everything, there are limited exceptions to this, um, such as if parties um, were married or in a civil partnership and um, that broke down and they were considering um, their financial settlement, then they could ask the court to set down in their final order an arrangement for payment of child maintenance. Um, I just say this for interest because remember this will not be relevant to the unmarried family but it's, it's something to note um, and even in those circumstances uh, that order for child maintenance is only good for up to 12 months after the order is made and after that period of time each party can just choose to contact the um, CMS anyway and ask them to recalculate child maintenance. Now, there are also certain limited circumstances when a receiving party can seek orders from the court under what's called Schedule 1 of the Children Act 1981, in addition to maintenance through the CMS. Next slide, please. So one of the Schedule 1 provisions um, that is most helpful is the family court's power to order what's called top-up maintenance, where the CMS has assessed that the payer's income exceeds the maximum maintenance assessment, which remember is currently £3,000 gross per week. So a bit of background history on Schedule 1 applications. Um, some of you may know that they have historically been made famous by rich celebrities such as Mick Jagger and Boris Becker. Um, in more recent times, rich footballers, all of whom who father children to unmarried mothers and have then been hit with um, applications um, for payments for the benefit of the children from the unmarried mothers. Um, under Schedule 1, the receiving party can seek payments for periodical payments, so that's top-up maintenance. Um, they can ask for lump sums of money or property, but all for the benefit of the child. And again, 
these sort of top ups are available in limited circumstances, including where the jurisdiction of the child maintenance service is not engaged, where the parties agree that periodical payments can be ordered, or where the CMS has made a maximum child support assessment. So again, something to note, you are looking into a Schedule 1 application, be sure to have your maximum assessment done by the CMS first. So an application for a payment of a sum of money can be to cover any cost associated with educating or raising that child. And it can include payments for things such as private school fees, private nursery fees, um, nanny and childcare costs, and even to cover things such as the cost of purchasing a car that's used for the benefit of the child. So provision can also be made for a transfer of property, i.e. a home in which the child is to live in. But note that obviously the parent the child lives with will also be living in that home at the same time. It can also be for a rental property, so a rental property and, and rent payments. Now, usually the paying party only has to provide the receiving party with such a home until that, that child or their children have finished their education, which in most circumstances we see as meaning university level education. The property then reverts back to the paying party, so it's not an outright transfer to the receiving party. I think what we can see very clearly from Schedule 1 provisions, therefore, is that any of these add-ons, if I can call them that, are for the benefit of the child and not the parent that they live with. And at some point in time, um, things will revert back to the paying party or those payments will end. So I'll now hand back to Maria, who will be able to tell us about some examples of these sorts of disputes that she has been instructed on. Thank you. Again, what I think I'll do is I'll share with you the details of two cases I've done more recently um, under Schedule 1 and highlight all of the issues that you've already taken us through. Unmarried family, uh, parent, one parent in both cases, this was the father who was a high earner above the CMS limit. And in these cases, both mothers, um, former girlfriends applied to the court under Schedule 1 for orders for the benefit of their children. Um, case study one, my client was in a committed relationship with her former partner for 18 years between 1999 to 2017 with the father of her two children. They had twin girls who were aged 14 when she came to see me. Although these, this couple had been engaged during their relationship, they never got married. And by reason of that, when they separated, of course, my client wasn't able to claim as a wife under the Matrimonial Causes Act for um, financial support um, and um, had then, therefore, the only option available to her was to claim under Schedule 1 of the Children Act. Um, this was a wealthy father and my client, the mother, had not worked during the relationship. At the time that the party separated, the father owned four properties in his sole name with equity of just shy of over 1.5 million. He had savings of around 66,000 in his bank account. He additionally lived in a property owned by his business, which was mortgage free and was valued at about 1.5 million. So aggregate, he was worth about 3 million, whereas my client, her, um, at the date she came to see me, was living in a property owned by the father, but had no other capital, nor savings, and no income at that time. The father had income in excess of four and a half thousand pounds a week gross. Um, and what my client sought therefore was a home for her children on the basis that the father was seeking to evict her from the property in which they had lived together as a family home. And she also wanted payments for the benefit of their twins um, to her whilst her twins were in full-time education. This was a case which was long and hard fought and, and, and it has to be said these cases generally are um, not always the case but uh, usually the case that if a father has not married the mother, the mother's not married the father, it's because they do not want to uh, mix their finances and share their finances and at the end of the relationship they don't need to. So this was a case which is not altogether unusual in which the father did not want to provide the mother with neither a home nor payments but ultimately what a judge at a, in the family court did was order that the father uh, be required to provide the mother 
with a um, monthly sum to cover the cost of renting a four bedroom property. Uh, for our own reasons, we chose to do a rent because the mother wanted to live near the twin school um, and um, we couldn't identify a property to buy. So the father was to provide monthly payments of rent to cover the cost of um, securing a four bed property near the children's school for the next seven years. That's until they were 21 or completed university education, whichever was the later. He also was to provide us with the a lump sum to cover the cost of moving into that rental property and then further to buy a new washing machine and fridge freezer for the rental property. And lastly, he was to provide the mother with monthly child maintenance payments by reason that the CMS was not engaged and this was a, he was a maximum earner. And so this was a classed as top up maintenance. So that gives you an idea about the sorts of things and covers all the topics that uh, Manisha has already covered. My second case study it, it was somewhat similar. similar. Uh, my client again was the mother and again there were two children. In this case they were 15 and 12 years old and my client was a teaching assistant so this time she did have a form of income but was a low income earner whereas the father in this case was uh, a high income owner. He was a banker he earned in excess of about 210,000 per annum before bonuses, so it was above the CMS limit. Um, and these parents again had been um, uh, unmarried. The finances, um, in, in this case, my client sought payments to her to cover the cost of the children's private school fees. Although she did have an income and she was able to provide a home for herself, she wasn't able to cover the cost of educating the children. And therefore, she sought the cost of the school fees which the children were attending, which were in about in excess of 23000 per child per annum. She also sought the cost of um, the school extracurricular activities, um, which were incredibly expensive, uh, school uniform costs, and thereafter one-off um, large one-off extras per year such as I took off the cost of iPads, iPhones, computers etc and she, wa she wanted the court to provide her with that annually um, so that she wouldn't have to go back to the father every year cap in hand asking for, for, for money so he, she sought an order that he annually provide her with that cost and then lastly she um, sought and obtained child maintenance uh, monthly payments of £2,000 from the father. So um, uh, that would again was a case where an application had to be made under Schedule 1 for the benefit of children until they were 21 um, for payments um, to the mother to co cover the cost of raising them and educating them. These cases are really complex because uh, what's needed is detailed financial disclosure from both part, both parents uh, to look at the costs of raising a child and then affordability, the means of payment from the other parent. They're usually hard fought. Uh, and so what's crucial in these cases, any good lawyer will open up dialogue at the earliest stage uh, and see if anything can be negotiated outside of the court arena as much as possible. Um, to keep down costs and to keep down the litigation stress, um, to keep it as low as possible. So these are cases where lawyers are often required. Thanks, Thanks Maria. <clears throat> um, we've now got some time to deal with some questions, but before we do that, you'll find that a poll will pop up on screen. If you'd like us to contact you directly, then please complete the poll. Um, obviously, the information will be confidential. And equally, if we don't get to your question today, then do feel free to actually um, let us know, contact us, and we'll come back to you with any questions we haven't dealt with today. So um, just looking at some of the questions that have come in, um, the first one, Jim, might be for you. My partner is planning to move in with me. What steps can I take to protect my property? Um. I'm not sure if you can see me because I've got this, the poll over my um, screen, but um, there are a number of things which you can do. Um, first and foremost, um, discuss the situation with the lawyer because, as I said, the, doc the documentation really is key. Now, if you're 
contributing equally to a property, then you should consider something like a declaration of trust. If you're planning someone to move into a property you already own, then you may want to think about something like a cohabitation agreement. So the thing about this situation is that there are, there are a number of different permutations and, and really what we can do is, is tailor an answer to, to your situation, which is protective but clear and ensures that um, each person understands what will happen when you know certain payments are made for example mortgage payments and that they aren't intended to give rise to an interest in the property for example so doing that at the outset would, would, would be a very good idea but but equally I think um, to cover some of the situations that Maria discussed if you're if you've been separated for example and you are thinking of um, doing something to the property then you really would be well advised to speak to a lawyer because it can really solve a whole lot of heartache to to do that rather than spending the money and assuming in this area assumptions i think are, are, are the mother of all um miseries if you like so speak to someone before you act i think that would be that would be the general thing whatever um permutation that that you happen to to fall into Okay, thanks Jim. Um, another question, my partner and I have separated. We have three children and would like to come to a parenting arrangement. Is this something you can help with? Um, as I touched on earlier, we can absolutely help you draft a parenting plan. Um, if you need some help negotiating, then we would recommend initially that you try and use the mediator because that's much more helpful for the two of you to be able to talk in a space freely where the mediator can help you reach an arrangement or alternatively you could approach us and we can help you liaise with your partner and draft something for you so if, if we can be of assistance then do do let us know um, okay i think we've got time for one more question um, the father of my two children has not been paying child maintenance for the past four months what can i do about this uh, manisha yeah okay so firstly we'd need to break that down a little bit so if your child maintenance arrangement has been agreed between you and dad then obviously it's a discussion that the two of you need to have between yourselves um, and figure out why that hasn't been happening um, is he having difficulties because of the financial impact of COVID-19 or is it a situation that is going to require you to now do things through the child maintenance service um, if your arrangement is already through the child maintenance service, then you must contact them um, and let them know that you haven't been receiving payments from dad for the last four months. Um, and as I explained, the child maintenance service does have the power to chase payments and also enforce. But be mindful of the fact that from what we've been hearing over the last two, three months, the child maintenance service has perhaps been a little lax in chasing or enforcing just because of the global financial impact. Um, upon everyone. But I think as we are coming out of um, lockdown restrictions, the CMS will start picking up on chases and enforcement. So either way, please do take it up with whomever you need to, um, to get your payments back in place. And if you need us to help, just let us know and, and we'll step in for you. Okay, that's great. Well, we're approaching the end of the webinar today. As I say, complete the poll or contact us, any of us directly. Um, if you do have any questions, if we haven't been able to deal with the question that you posed today. Um, I'd like to thank all my co-presenters and also thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Goodbye.